<laughs> well, we the, hear that part. <laughs> yeah, look the devil being busy. We're going to still have a good time, okay? <laughs> I can't hear you, Coach Queen. No. Oh, okay. What about now? Okay, now. Yeah. Okay, got it. Let me tell you. Perfect. This disruption was brought to us by the Blue Yeti microphone. You see, with the Blue Yeti microphone, you have to go in and make sure all of the wiring is securely connected because for some reason, my wiring popped out and I've been talking to myself for the last five minutes. So, all right, let's get it. All right, now, and today I thought it would be a great, great idea to go back and revisit the vision that God has put on your life. Raise your hand if you are crystal clear about the vision that God has for you. Raise your hand. Who's crystal clear, ready to articulate? Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Ms. D. Yes, because you guys have already been in the class. Thank you, Rukama, as well. So today, we're going to talk about the five worthy dynamics of a vision. These are the components that you need in order to have a vision that is in alignment with God and in alignment with your life. And so if you have not done so already, please go ahead, grab pen and paper, because we're gonna take this thing to the next level. Some of you come to me and you say, you know, Coach Queen, uh, should I go with this company or should I go with that company? Should I launch my platform virtually or should I do my platform face-to-face? -face? Should I write a book? Should I support or joint venture with this person? When should I start? All these questions. Coach Queen, I got a calling. I got this message that I want to put out, but I don't quite know how to launch. I don't know what platforms to use. I don't know what people to attract. Well, usually when people come to me with questions like that, the first thing I ask them to do is to open up their screen and show me their vision statement. I'm not talking about that cute little three sentence vision statement that we see when we go inside corporations. I'm talking about your vision for life. Because what does it what does it say in scripture? Write it down and make it plain. And where there is no vision, what? The people will perish. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you, Rukama. I saw you mouthing it. You got my back. Listen, loves, you got to write this down. You can't use this as a filing cabinet to record your vision. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to turn this into a sort of working session because I want you to take action on your vision. And so I'm going to give you five worthy components. So if you have not done so already, again, grab pen and paper so that you can write it down and then you can meditate on it. You can allow it to marinate. And then next week, Thursday, when you're driving past the park, something extraordinary happens. The energy that you threw up today, when it comes back down next week or tomorrow or at the end of the day, you're like, it's like a quickening, like, oh, I got it. I got it. I understand the calling for my life. I know how to make a decision on the people that I should have in my life. I know how to make a decision about the book that I'm writing. I know how to make a decision as where to invest my funds. I know how to make decisions as to what belongs on my calendar. When you write out your vision powerhouses, you're going to be able to come up with a list of your non-negotiables. There's just certain places I won't go to. I won't go. There's certain people I just won't go around. Certain things I just won't participate in. Because one of the first things I ask myself, because I know that God has given me this vision, one of the first things I ask myself, and I want you to ask yourself, is if I do this, does this get me closer to my vision? Does it close the gap on my vision? Or does it push me further away from my vision? I was looking up the definition of sin, S-I-N, sin the other day and the definition of sin and it has a lot of multifaceted meanings and and definitions behind its etymology and we all know that when we sin we're breaking one of god's divine laws right that is what it means to sin but at the root level of the word sin the etymology of the word sin in greek 
It means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. I want you to ask yourself, in what areas of your life are you missing your mark? Is God calling you to do something, but somebody offered you $20,000, $100,000, and you got off the path to chase that money, Will you know that God is going to, come on now, abundance minus abundance is abundance. Your father, he got it all. You don't need anybody's measly little $20,000. You don't need it. God got you. He has you. Are you missing the mark? Are you missing the mark on your calling? Are you missing the mark in your business? Because you believe that if you project the culture of our heavenly father, that is going to cost you some money. Are you missing the mark? Are you in a toxic job in corporate? You hate this job, but you think, oh my goodness, how am I going to feed my children? So I got to continue doing this job that I hate because I got to feed these kids that I love. Are you missing the mark? So what we're going to do now is we're going to write down five components of a worthy vision so that we no longer miss the mark. Because I don't want you to think about sin as, oh, I'm not sinning because I'm not lying, I'm not killing, I'm not stealing, I'm not coveting, I'm not sinning. But if you are missing the mark, you are sinning. You cannot be lazy with your walk with God. You cannot be lazy with your beliefs when it comes to God. We need strong, powerful women. We need elders, we need mothers, we need sages. And sometimes closing the gap in between where you are now and where God has destined you to be depends just as much on you making the right decision as it does on how much time you spend off the path. How many of you know, if you let the wrong person in your life, you make the wrong financial decision, it can set you back five years. It can delay you 10 years. We gotta gain ground on our vision so that we can make the right decisions because it is costing us time that we do not have. When you are writing out your vision, I want you to also, and I know that I'm going to step on some toes when I say this, I need you to also consider the foods that you're putting in your mouth. If you are going to be this bionic, this optimum woman, then that means it takes some supersonic rocket fuel. You can't be going to McDonald's every freaking day. You cannot do it. That is a decision that you need to make. Is the food that I'm consuming, is it going to get me closer to my vision or is it going to set me back? Am I going to be in the hospital three years from now laid up being treated for a preventable illness? When all I had to do was make a decision that aligns with God, that aligns with the vision that he has for me, but I was disobedient. And so now I got to spend five years off the path. So again, let's go ahead and get you started. I'm going to give you a point. And then as I give you a point, I'm going to give you two minutes of private time to actually write down your answer to each point. Now, I'm not going to ask you to share your point. This is between you and God. And when you are ready, you share it with the world. Unleash it with the world when you are ready. If God calls you to share it with the world, completely up to you. But I want you to take this time to take this seriously and write it down note for note. And keep in mind that as we go through each step, later on in the day, later on in the week, feel free to expand on it. But write it down. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Evidence. You got to give it evidence. When I asked God, maybe about 15 years ago or so, I was told that I had a brain tumor. And they gave me this little pill to treat the tumor. And that little pill rocked my body. And I prayed to God, God, heal me from this tumor. 
And after I said that prayer, because faith without work is dead, I stood up and I acted as though I didn't have a tumor. I was, Listen, I gave it to God. I'm good now. I just carried on like I wasn't sick. Went to work, performed my mission. I was on active duty in the military. You would never know that I had just got diagnosed with a brain tumor because I had to give that situation evidence. When you write down your vision, I want you to start thinking about how you can give that situation evidence. Don't come to me saying that you are the CEO of some fabulous fashion store like Keys Kia, who Keys Kia represents by example with this, of a fashion line that shows faith-driven women how to dress fashionably with confidence. Because you know you can believe in God, dress modest, and look real good. Oh, you can look real good, my love. You don't have to let everything show. You don't have to, you can shake that spirit of rejection and get it off you. That spirit of rejection, having to have everything out and showing in order to attract attention. You don't have to be an attention junkie. Keys Kia is supplying evidence. She's like, listen, before she opened her first brick and mortar store in Ghana, Africa, shots out the Keys Kia for that who's on here, Queen Slayton, you'll see her there. Before she opened that up, she walked apart. Before she had the finances to launch her business, she walked apart. She gave that vision evidence. Okay, so I think that I went on uh, enough. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right. The first thing I want you to write down is this vision, whatever it is that you write down, it has to take you at least a minimum of 10 years to reach fruition. That's how big it is. 10 years to reach fruition. Because if you say something like, I have a vision that I can pay all my bills, that's something that can happen next month. I need for it to be big. I want you to write down something that it feels like you wrote down, I'm going to climb Mount Everest within the next 10 years. And it makes you gasp like, oh, like, how in the world am I going to climb? You know how many people died trying to climb Mount Everest? How in the world am I going to do that? I need for it to blow your mind. And when you write it down, you are not writing down the how. You're not writing that down. You just, bam, you're dropping that vision. It is bigger than anything that you can possibly imagine. And so you're going to have to elicit the help of the, the Holy Spirit. Because boy, is the Holy Spirit creative. Will plant some stuff in your mind that will blow your mind. All right? 10 years to reach fruition. You got that? Okay, we're going to keep going because you need some more information in order to feed it. All right, the next thing is it has to take more than you to make this happen. However God created us, he created us in such a way that we need each other. Absolutely, you can't do it by yourself. So this vision, it may need a web architect, a virtual assistant, it may need uh, an executive officer, you may need some staff. This, this, Whatever this vision is, it's, it takes more than your two hands to make it happen. So you're going to start drawing out your organization chart. And it can be the bare minimum right now, but draw it out. Because as God pour more into your vision, you'll be able to say, okay, I need this. And don't be surprised if when you are done, you discover that 10 years from now, you have created a company that spans five countries and employs 20,000 people. Don't be surprised. Because people don't need handouts. Some of you are going to say, well, I want to start a nonprofit organization. Beautiful. People don't want handouts. People want the opportunity to earn a quality of life with dignity and respect. That's what they want. They want that opportunity. So it takes more than your hands. So for number two, you're going to do an org chart. 
Now here's where your break comes in. For number three, what you're going to do is you're going to write down five things, a minimum of five things that you've been through. Five things you've been through because nothing gets wasted. If you say to me, queen, I was homeless in 1996. In my mind, I'm like, wow, what a powerhouse this woman can be for the homeless. If you said, Queen, in the year 2002, I worked at McDonald's. I was a minimum wage employee. How in the world can I go from that to a CEO? In my mind, I'm thinking, oh, you know what it's like to work under some pressure and to work under pressure and get paid peanuts. You know what it's like to deal with some outrageous customers because when people are hungry, they're not in their best character. Oh, you've been battle tested. So then I'm gonna say, wow, not only can you assist the homeless, but maybe you can create some type of a kingdom kitchen for the homeless. Cause you're now you're able to combine your experience being homeless with the fact that you once worked for peanuts. So now what you're going to do is you're gonna write down a minimum of five things that you've been through in your life. Five things, because again, nothing gets wasted. You went through it for a reason. You know, it's interesting when God calls you to do something and you think to yourself, well, how can I speak? I'm not a gifted speaker. How can I speak? Like me, I was a teenager with a speech impediment. Who's gonna listen to me? Who can I influence? Because if you were like me, you got pregnant in high school. God tutors, all of those lessons you went through, those were your tutoring sessions, everything. Oh my goodness, we usually think of gifts as something that we love. Oh my goodness, I opened this gift, wow, it's just perfect for me. But trials and tribulations are gifts. How many of you know that? Oh, it, it, it's like, it's better than any university you can join. I once read about a man who went to business school and when he was in business school, he learned um, all of these different things to get his MBA, his master's in business. And when he graduated, he had a $125,000 debt from going to school. On the other hand, there was this man and he wanted to learn about business. And he said, well, I can't afford business school. This is what he did. He went and he bought a house a foreclosed house and he worked, he learned how to build it from the ground up and restore it and create contracts. And he taught himself. And when he was done, he was in debt, $25,000. He, he was in debt, but he didn't have that $125,000 debt like the other man did, but they got the same lessons. They both were very powerful in business. All the things that you have gone through is called the school of the hard knocks. So when you are writing down and you're look, collecting experience for why you're the right one for what it is that you're called to do, let me say one, calling will always trump training. Will always trump training. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you how many people have stepped on a stage and when they stepped on the stage to speak, they brought their skills with them. They knew how to stand. They knew how to use body language. They knew how to stay in the square. They knew not to fire hose people like this when they were talking. They brought the skills, but they didn't have the heart. They didn't have the calling. I didn't necessarily have all the skills. I most definitely did not own the $5,000 words but I had the calling. Your calling will always trump somebody else's training because God trains. All right, so I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you about five minutes, my loves. If you can come up with 10 things, that's absolutely fine. And the reasons why I have you writing down these five things that you went through, these are problems that you went through, is because people need solutions to everyday problems. Everyday problems, you guys heard me say it before. They need solutions to everyday problems. 
They don't need for you to bring rocket science to them. They need to know. Listen, when I raised my daughters, I wasn't the best mom, but now I'm better and my daughter is grown, but I don't quite know how to get back into her life. I have grandchildren I've never met. Rukama, can you help me? Can you help me to get a better relationship with my daughter so I can work on my legacy? Betula, they want to know. I got caught at work with drugs and alcohol. I don't know if I'll ever be able to work in corporate again. Can you help me? Can you help me with that? Heidi, they, they want to know. Listen, I'm a father. I know I was a deadbeat for the last four years, but I want to be in my kid's life, but I don't quite know how to do it because the gatekeeper, the mom, she won't even let me speak to them. But they got my last name, Heidi. How can I? How can I get a relationship with my children? They need solutions to everyday problems. What you have in your history is everyday problems. And so I need for you to write down at least five things that you went through, no matter how small you think it is. Some of you have been sexually assaulted, I know. Some of you have been molested, I know. Homeless, I know. Got your car repossessed, I know. House foreclosed, filed bankruptcy. Some of you lost parents way too early, children way too early. And then there's also disenfranchised grief, the grief that nobody considers as grief. There are people whose world has been rocked because they lost their pet. That's disenfranchised grief. Did you lose an animal that you just like, oh my goodness, it took me three years to recover because it was like losing a child. Okay, I'm gonna give you five minutes. You guys get the gist. Write down five things you've been through. If you come up with 10, great. Any questions before I give you this five minute break to just get laser focused on your list, writing down five things that you know you went through for a reason and now because you have come out on the other end, you have gained the experience to be somebody else's survival guide. Any questions about this assignment? Okay, I am going to give you five minutes let me check the chat i'll check the chat if you have a question i'll respond in the chat that way i don't disturb your five minutes sound good all right great your five minutes begins now love okay let's keep going i gave you just a little bit more than five minutes let's keep going all right to recap the first thing that we wrote down was it must take at least 10 years to reach fruition if it just solves problems for this month or next year it is not a worthy vision the next thing is that your vision number two your vision requires collaboration that's why you're building your organization chart it's not just about you that's why i can't stand when i hear about women at war one of the biggest epidemics that nobody is talking about is sisters at war, whether it is the sisters that you share at the womb with or your, your spiritual sisters. Because who does it benefit when women are at war? When we say, oh my goodness, I know we used to be friends, but I don't need her anymore. I got this. Because who comes to kill, steal, and destroy? Who does it benefit? It benefits the devil. You may be thinking, oh my goodness, it's okay that we're not friends anymore. I can move on. But God uses people to help you. God works through people. God works through you to help other people. We need one another. And your worthy vision, it requires collaboration. So number two, it requires collaboration. Number three, you just wrote down a list of problems that you had in your life. And the reason why you did that is because you understand those problems. It is so easy for you to step in and start doing work right now because you're already qualified. You've been battle tested and you understand that you went through those things for a reason so that you can reach back and you can help other people. So you wrote down those five things. Now, when you finish writing down those five things, my loves, 
even if like Kiana asked, if it is something you are still going through, that's absolutely fine because you don't know when God is gonna absolutely deliver you from that problem. Now, there is a saying where it says, don't teach from an open wound. Don't teach from an open wound. So if you're still going through something and you feel like, oh, if I talk about this, I am going to absolutely break down. There's a difference between breaking down where you're not useful and breaking down because you're vulnerable. If you are genuinely, authentically crying over something, that's absolutely fine because it helps you to connect with your audience to be genuine. But if you're breaking down to the point where your audience then feels this transfer of energy where now your audience is now trying to console you and be of help to you and wanna send you recipes, now the coach has become the client and the client has become the coach. So you have to decide if I talk about this thing, this problem while I'm still going through it, am I teaching from an open wound? There are certain things that I'm going through right now in life. I can absolutely talk about it because I've already given it to God and I can talk about it. In a second, I'm going to start my Daniel fast. I don't know if you ever heard of the Daniel fast. For some of you who are looking for an opportunity to get closer to God and really build your relationship with God, go into the book of Daniel's, read about the Daniel fast and see if that is a good fit for you. There's also tons of material about it online. It's all about starving your body, starving your flesh. And there are different ways to do it. You can eat when the sun goes down or you can completely do no food. You starve your flesh. So it's less flesh and more spirit. So I'll let you read more about that. But you have to make that decision about where you are in the stage of the problem. There are some coaches who teach while they're going through a problem and people love it because their emotions are so raw as they're teaching about the problem and you get to watch them go through it step by step. And it's just amazing. Oh, it really is amazing to watch. But you have to decide if you fit that category or not. Okay, so let's go to the next, the next step in your worthy vision. The next step is your worthy vision does not serve you. This vision is not there for you to help you make your pockets fatter. It's not, it's not about you. Your, whatever this vision is not even about you. Your vision serves others. So with the next step, step number four, what I need you to write down is, and I'm gonna give you five minutes to write it down. I need for you to write down who your vision serves. And one of the ways that you can write down who your vision serves is to go and look at the problems that you wrote down. Who needs help with those problems? The next question you can ask yourself is, who were you when you were going through those problems? Were you a single mother in your 40s, unemployed, living in Texas? And when you write down who your vision serves, please don't take five minutes and write down women. Don't just write down men. Don't just write down women and men. Don't just write business owners. You have to know your, your, your client intimately, intimately. And so you need to write down something like the examples I gave before. Men in their 50s who were caught at work with drugs and alcohol and now they cannot get back into the stock market because their records are blemished, for example. It needs to be filled. There are over 9 billion people on this planet. You do not serve people. Don't be selfish. You don't serve all nine. Don't be selfish. Not all energies mix. If I started dropping F-bombs right now, F-bomb this and D-bomb that, Bombs mean profanity for those of you <laughs> that were born sanctified and never cursed in your life. But if I started dropping F-bombs right now, 99% of you would just log out and say, listen, I gotta protect my energy. I didn't come here for that. That is an example of how not all energies mix. You're not here to serve 9 billion people. So I want you with clarity to write down 
who you are called to serve. Who does this vision benefit? Last Saturday at the rehearsal stage, I believe it was last Saturday of the rehearsal stage, Miss D, she's writing a book and she shared something about um, one of the hurdles, small hurdles, because it's nothing for Miss D. She just, she just runs through hurdles like it's nothing. But one of the small hurdles that she's facing is how much of herself to share. And so in her book, but at the end of the conversation, I gave a challenge to everyone to write a love letter to the person that your business, that your book that you're writing, write a love letter to that muse, that person, that your product, your life, that it serves, telling them all about how your business, your book, your podcast, your, your, your presentations, all about how this right here is gonna change their life. So with that said, I want you to write down the description, the psychographics, meaning their fears, the psychographics, the demographics, meaning are they married, are they divorced? Are they a student? Are they in business? Are they faith driven? Maybe God is calling you to be that light that steps into dark places. Light belongs in dark places too. So I want you to write down who your vision serves. Any questions before I give you five minutes to write this down? Any questions? Please unmute or drop your questions in the chat. Okay, my loves, your five minutes to write down, I mean specifically write down who your vision serves. You may say it serves single women in their teens who were, you know, got pregnant out of wedlock, but who are looking for God or looking for fashion or looking for better skin. We all want better skin. I know I do. Your five minutes, it begins now, loves. Okay, your five minutes is up, powerhouses. Now let me give you the final and fifth step that I'm gonna give you today. And this one should be a no brainer. It is up to you to identify how this vision glorifies God. We've given to, we have been given two tasks. One, to seek his kingdom and righteousness. Kingdom and righteousness. So when you sit back and you look at this vision that you have created, this vision that is authentically of you because it's based off problems that you've had in your life. And now you can use that to help meet other people's needs. This is a vision that you're going to spend at least 10 years of your life in the crawl, walk, run, and then soar stage. You need to know deep down that what you're doing is going to help bring God's kingdom here on earth. When people hire me to speak or when they approach me to speak and do different things, I let them know if God ain't in it, I ain't with it. I'm not going to do it. I spent 20 years in the military, not being able to be who I am authentically. Do you know how it feels to get paid and be forced to be in a position where if you smile is taken as a, a sign of weakness, can't even smile. I won't do it again ever. So my loves, with the last one, which really should be the first one, but when you vet it, it's all a combination of things. When you vet it, how does your faith tie into it? Now, I will tell you that for some of you, some of you may say, oh, when folks walk into my business, it's not like I am fire hosing them with God. I completely understand that because there are certain, let me share this with you. <laughs> Most of you know I'm in seminary school, right? I'm at Liberty University in, sem in seminary school working on a master's degree in pastoral counseling. In one of the classes that I took, we had to assess ourselves. And this is probably going to help some of you. We had to do this personal spiritual assessment. And the assessment is based on the three commandments in which God has given us. And you know, there are more commandments, but they all really tie into three. And the three commands are one, 
love for God. How do you show your love for God? In other words, when you wake up in the morning, do you start your day off with God? Like me, I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, I roll over and I just lay there before my house gets all of this personality, before the kids wake up and I have two dogs and a cat and you know all this other stuff. Before they need my attention, I just lay there and I, I, I meditate on my dreams because how many of you know that dreams is, is the oldest language? It's, dreams is really, even though dreams are, sleeping is supposed to be used for rest, but our dreams is, is, is also God's way of speaking with us. You can travel in your dreams. How many of you know that? Turn off the TV, turn off the music, and invite God into your dreams. If you're going to be sleeping, go ahead and have a, an angelic conversation while you're doing it. And so I wake up in the morning and, and I, I, I speak to God and I talk about different things and, you know, to my father and ask him, Lord, order my steps, order my steps, Heavenly Father. And I pray. So the first command is love for God. The second command is love for one another. By love for one another, it means to um, love your fellow believers people who are like you who believe like you people who have faith like you so when you go to church and you um you, you participate in church activities when you participate in the ministry that's love for one another the next and final step is love thy neighbor your neighbors consist of non-believers and a lot of the times we can just just enjoy being with people who believe like us and it's just so amazing but we have to take time to get out and hang out with the non-believers just last saturday i went to a an event with non-believers i'm sharing this with you because i rank low on that i rank really low on hanging with non-believers because i'm like i don't want to be around all the profanity i protect my gateways you know my ears and my eyes and everything i don't want to be around that stuff but I know that I have to go. And when I go, I go because I know that God gives me an opportunity to be that light in the room. And when I go, I don't walk in saying, Jesus this, Jesus that, God this, God that. I just live by example. And when they serve food, I'll say something like, let's say grace. Or just like last Saturday, my eight-year-old who for some reason has told me that she is going to be a pastor and that I'm gonna be her assistant. And when I tell her, when she tells me to give her the oil, I give her the oil and she anoint, I don't know how I became an assistant, but anyway, I'm the assistant. But my eight-year-old is all the women gathered at the table. It's a big table at the park and we're eating and we're fellowshipping because eating is a great way to fellowship with believers and non-believers. And we're just talking and I'm having fun. I'm showing them that, hey, being a Christian, you can have fun. I can do the snake and I can do the Reebok and all that other stuff as well, right? My eight-year-old, eight-year-old empress, she breaks away from with her friends, comes to the table and she says, I gotta pray with y'all. I gotta pray for y'all. And so everyone bows their head except for these two people at the end. And I say, hey, listen, my daughter would like to pray for us. Um, if you don't believe, I just ask that you sit in silence. But if you do believe, I ask if you would, just bow your head. And my eight-year-old, she comes and she prays and she says, Oh, Lord, we love you so much. We need you, Heavenly Father. And she's praying and she's praying and she's praying. Then at the end, she's like, in Jesus' name, amen. And she gives me a kiss, bye-bye, and she runs back to the park. And I slowly open my eyes and I look up. And the lady to my right is balling. She's, I mean, she's balling. It's beautiful Hispanic lady, just balling and balling. My first thought was my daughter, as usual, has come into the scene, made this mess, and I got to clean it up because she does that a lot. I got to clean it up. And so I turn to my half right to console her. And I just look at her. I don't say anything first. And she's like, <gasps> I needed that. And she just starts telling me all the stuff she's going through and blah, 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 blah. And I console her. And then I get back and I focus on the table. And the next thing you know, people just start coming to me and saying, hey, how can I develop a work relationship with God? And I didn't, I didn't Bible thump anybody. I just showed up and said, hey, I'm having a good time and my kids are having a good time and that's it. So what I'm saying to you is, it is okay to be around non-believers in your vision 
in your vision statement, please make sure you allocate an avenue for that. They need for us to be that light in the dark room because a lot of them are on first place, on first base, and your presence will come in and knock them to second base. Or maybe they're on third base and you come in with your leading by example because you are not lazy with your walk with God. You don't have a different outfit for church than you have when you go to Walmart. When you go to church, you look like a woman of God. And if I see you in Walmart, you look like a woman of God. You're always in character. And because you're always in character and because you're always projecting who you are as a child of God, people know how to take a withdrawal from you. Even your family. I don't care if two days ago you were with your family at the barbecue, cursing up a storm, dressed like you worked at the club. I don't care if you did that two days ago. You can make a decision to change today at three o'clock if you want to. You absolutely can. You don't need nobody's permission. Okay, listen, I think I don't went into it long enough. So let me just recap. Number five, you're going to make sure that your vision takes at least 10 years. Number four, you're going to make sure that you create staffing positions, whether you're delegating. You can delegate. You don't have to spend money. You can delegate. You can hire. You can also automate. You can use your systems. Like I use Kajabi, CRM, Client Relationship Management Systems, so that you can grow your email list. But number two, it requires collaboration. You can't just do it with your two hands. If all it takes is you, it ain't big enough. If it don't scare you when you write it down, like how in the world, it ain't big enough. And you should ask for big things. This is the God that parted the Red Sea. And you asking him for small stuff. Pay my bills, God. Small stuff. I was watching this little uh, genie movie with the girls. The genie came out the lamp. You know, the genie that grants wishes. The genie came out the lamp and the genie said, big power, itty bitty living space. That's how I feel about the Holy Spirit. When I invite the Holy Spirit in, I'd be like, oh, I want all this power. I know it's such a little bitty living space, but come by here, my Lord. Come by here. All right, number three, number three. It must solve a problem that you understand. And this is going to help so many of you because when somebody comes by with multi-level marketing and they're like, invest in gold and you can make money or come and work this oil rig and you can make money. Well, did God train you up on that? Is there a seed already planted in you about gold or oil? If it is, lean with it, rock with it. But if it ain't, it ain't in alignment with you. It ain't in alignment with what God has called you to do. So when you are asked to do something, you check with your vision and say, I never got a glimpse of that in my future. So you don't spend so much time off the path. All right, so number three, your vision solves a problem that you understand. That's why you're gonna write out all those problems. And for the problems that you are no longer in alignment with solving, like I've, bar I've let people borrow money. They never paid me back. Well, I don't want to talk about it. So I just draw a gentle line through it because that's not what my vision is about. Draw a line through the things that your vision is not about and focus on the things that you have left. All right. So that was number three. Number two, it doesn't just serve you. You are going to niche down who your vision serves. Men and women in their 20s who have college debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now let me say, when you niche down to who you serve, if you say my vision serves women who were incarcerated and had kids, for example, doesn't mean that you can't help men who are incarcerated. Doesn't mean that you're not, you're not, listen, you're not boxed in, but right now you're getting clear on who you are absolutely called to serve. So that way you understand that, oh goodness, I don't have to close a lot of knowledge gaps in order to start. I just need you to start. Because as you start, after you write down this vision, God will change the plan. Oh my goodness, my loves. I started off making vegan recipes in my kitchen, just playing around with vegan recipes. God changed the plan. Next thing you know, I had two full service vegan restaurants. 
Never wanted to get into the restaurant business, but God wanted me to bring healthy choices to the community. All right, so that was number four. And then number five, it must glorify God. You might say, well, Queen, there are a lot of people out there that are doing what I do, but it don't glorify God, but you ain't them. You're worried about your salvation. You want to secure your spot in heaven. You want to please God. You want to spend your time wisely. You want to be who you are authentically. Because when I step on stage and I say, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, I don't want nobody finding me because I'm being who I am naturally. I remember when I was in the army and they told me that my Afro, it couldn't stick out more than two inches and all this stuff, but I'm black. My hair naturally, naturally cool. It naturally did stuff. So a lot of black women, we relax our hair and eventually we got alopecia and all this other stuff because we could not be authentically who we are because it was against the regulation. You in your business, because you are not building a prison for yourself, you have an opportunity to be naturally who you are. You don't have to filter your words naturally who you are so that God can use you. All right, so that was all five. That was all five. All right, you have a question about who your business serves. Okay, what's your question, Precious? And I'm gonna send you guys into a 10 minute breakout room just so you can network and meet with each other. So go ahead and grab your social media handles. Go ahead and grab your, uh, your scheduling software. So that way when we close out, you can go and talk to each other and give each other 100% of the information when the time runs out. Precious, oh yeah, there you go. Go ahead and unmute my love. Never pass up the opportunity to take the mic. I love that, Precious. What is your question? I'm sorry, I couldn't get, I was trying to figure out how to unmute and it was doing all this crazy stuff. But um, <laughs> hello everyone. <laughs> um, so my question is uh, about like who I serve. At first, I, it started off as like young adults, millennials. And um, I guess I still am a millennial, but when I do events, because I do like Christian events, okay, um, that's pretty much my business. It's open to kind of like everyone. So I don't really know if I should just keep it that way or just geared my, um, my marketing towards like, you know, uh, young adults, adolescents. Yeah. Um, and then if people, other people want to come, they can come. If they don't, they don't, you know what I mean? I just, I don't know. I just, I just open it up to like, you can, anyone can come. I open it up to, if people want to bring their kids, they can bring their kids. The people have brought their kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do like, uh, open mics. I do Christian karaoke. I'll do like game night, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's just for, for us to come together and have a good time. Not always everything is like you know, Bible, 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 down there. and um, it's it's a place for people to come together, believers to come together, and fellowship. Yeah, just have a good time, fun, laugh, games, and stuff like that. Love you. Um, even you know, and so when I do that, I open it up for everyone. So it's kind of hard to like, like specific, you know, specify like what particular group or audience I'm looking at. Because even at the last event I did, like I had senior citizens there, you know, like, yeah. and, and they participated. So it was good. I had senior citizens there. I had someone there in their 80s. I had someone there young and a six-year-old there. So, and they enjoyed themselves, you know, from my understanding. So I just, I just kind of like want to really kind of hone in on my audience because okay. It's a little hard. <laughs> I love this. So now I don't have to ask the question because your question is, Coach Queen, how do I narrow in on my target audience with specificity so that I can track who's for me, right? Yes. That sounds perfect. Okay, listen. So one of the first things, and I love this question because this is going to help almost all of you. Whenever you do an event, one of the first questions you have to ask yourself is what problem does it solve? Even when you write a presentation, what problem does it solve? And a lot of the times you will find that each event that you do, because like you said, Precious, some of your events are more like, ha, ah, and it's more biblically based, and some of them are more adventurous. Well, that's psycho there's a psychological difference in between people who want more, ah, 
and people who want to really just have fun and get down with God, if I may say that, Father. So what I'm saying to you is those are different client avatars. Those are different people. Sometimes it mix. Like me, sometimes I like to have a lot of good fun and sometimes I just want to be sanctified. And so sometimes it mix. But nonetheless, you still are attracting a different client avatar. So the first thing you're going to ask is, what problem does this event solve? What problem does this presentation solve? And who needs a solution to this problem? Because not everybody needs a solution of karaoke. Here in El Paso, I don't know, is it you, Precious? I can't remember. Somebody here in Texas is doing a, a Christian karaoke night. That was me. That was you. Yes. Yeah. I sent some folks your way. <laughs> Hopefully they showed up. That was you, Precious. Okay, great. So with the Christian karaoke night, right, especially for family, not everybody has family. And I know it was open for family. If you're single, you can still come. But it is important to niche it down to specifically to who you want to attract. Because remember what I said, when you niche it down, even if in your marketing you say, that this is for Christian couples, you're still gonna attract other people. When you niche it down, my loves, your, your niche is just your sign on the door. Right now, I could say that this is a class for women who don't like the sound of their voice. And I can say that I'm a speaking coach. I'm still gonna attract and have attracted men who didn't like the sound of their voice. I attracted women who like the sound of their voice but they need help building their keynote talk. So your sign, when you niche it down, it is just the sign on the door. You don't wanna vomit everything that you can do in all of your services on your sign because then you are faced with the dilemma called the paradox of choice. And psychology, the paradox of choice says that when you give people a lot of choices, that means that they either um, are paralyzed and it takes them forever to make a choice or they just don't make a choice. So you want to make it simple for them. Now, the reason why you want to niche it down and understand specifically who you're talking to, it is also for strategic reasons. Because eventually, if you really want to grow your business and you really want to get the visibility on your calling that your calling deserves, you're going to have to lean on paid marketing. You can't just do organic marketing. Organic marketing is when you market on social media, just from your account. When you say, hey, everybody, I'm doing this thing. Organic is free marketing. Free marketing, organic marketing, is when you market like on Eventbrite or meetups, right? Those are free. Eventually, you're gonna wanna reach the world. And when you do that, you're going to have to invest in your business. Now, if you're not willing to invest in your business, you don't have a business. You're gonna to have to invest in your business. You're gonna to have to invest in marketing. And when you invest in marketing for those pay ads loves, it can cost you as the CEO anywhere from $5 to $22 every time someone clicks on your ad. You're gonna say, this organic marketing on Facebook just simply coming out on my, my page and saying, hey, I got this event coming on on Thursday. And what you will find that you don't get many takers at all. People may like it, but they don't really show up from that free organic. You will find that you need to create an ad and it will circulate the world wide web. And every time somebody clicks on it and you don't know why, they, I have people click on my ads because they like my hair wrap. And they're like, hey, how can I do my hair wrap like yours? But they're not interested. And because they click that ad, it cost me anywhere from $5 to $22. And they may not even show up or participate in my events. So you wanna get clear about who it is you serve with the understanding that people from all over are gonna be clicking on your ad. So if I have a fashion company, I want people who are interested in fashion clicking on my ad. I only want my, my marketing to go to those people that are interested in fashion. I do not want my marketing to go to that woman in the nudist colony who don't wear clothes. She, people in the nudist call, colony clicking on my ads costing me money when they're not even interested, right? So you want to be specific. It's gonna save you a lot of money. And just because you're niching down doesn't mean that the people that are for you won't find you. You'll still have men, women, all the people that are outside your niche 
contacting you. And then you as a CEO can make a decision as to if you want to serve them because you're a CEO. You don't have to say, well, my sign says I only serve women. You can make a decision. You're not boxed in. Does that help you, Precious? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So you're just creating this. You're welcome. You're just creating that sign on the door. Because when you niche down and figure out who it is that you're called to serve based on the problem that your product, your business, and your service solves, then you can study that person. It is a lot easier to say that I've niched down to women in their 50s who who were professors all their life now they want to start their own business now i can just go and study those women because now when i do my marketing i need to understand their psychology i need to understand their spirituality because you can say well i serve everybody well there's a psychological difference between attracting women in their 20s and women in their 50s they not after the same things and your presentation won't flow the same way when I am speaking to millennials, when I write my presentations, it has a lot of engagement in it. I'm like, if you're from Texas, raise your hand. If you have a dog, put a one in the chat. It has a lot of engaging pieces. Why? Because I understand that millennials and those that were raised up under the technological eras, they love their cell phones. And I'm competing with this. And because I know that I'm competing with this, I have to control their bodies. So I constantly have them standing up, raising their hands, shouting out, calling response. Whereas with the older crowds who are used to being loyal, who are used to being committed in what they do, I don't have to add so many engagement pieces. It's all strategy. So it is important if you really want to see some change in what you're doing, it is important to niche down understand a small demographic of people first and then as god leads you you can expand and make it bigger and bigger but all of that stuff is is strategy and it is important but start with what problem it solves because you're not opening a business you're not writing a speech just to talk you're doing it because it solves a problem you got to understand that problem that it specifically solves all right i know i went around the world but i hope that you got something out of it all right Hopefully there was something in it for everybody. Okay. I think so. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. The niching piece, it takes a, it takes um, a second and don't feel like, well, if I niche down, I'm, I'm leaving people out. I, if I niche down, I'm leaving money on the table. I know all of that. I know, but my love, sometimes, sometimes when we, when we open a business or when we start anew, when God has renewed our mind and we start anew, Sometimes we have this expectation to go from 3.0 to 10, like in a matter of a month or a year. It is significant to go from 3.0 to 3.2 to 3.5 to 4.0 to do it gradually. And when you niche down and you go from 3.0 to 3.0 version of you to the 3.5 version of you, oh, that's significant. That is so significant. And it is going to help you to gain that, F, that that evidence and that confidence that you need in order to get to where you need to be in your vision. All right. Okay, loves, let me go ahead and send you into a 10 minute breakout session. I'm just going to open it right on up because most of you know how to work it. You have a choice. The breakout rooms are open. Remember to network and if you see somebody in there that you like and you want to talk with later say hey here's my information what's your information let's talk about it later. Uh, great we got Terilyn. Um no Terilyn hasn't joined the group yet go ahead and take your mouse and hover over um, the breakout room you want to go in and feel free to hop around from breakout room to breakout room if nobody is in the breakout room you want to join. You can go and talk about who your worthy vision serves and use someone as a sounding board. Kiana, are you speaking? Are you? Are you guys good? Okay, great, you're going. All right, you can go in and talk about social media. You can talk about speaking ideas. You can go into the gratitude room. Oh, Miss Victoria, I like that outfit you got on on your profile picture, that's nice. Tara Lynn, I like that book. Make sure you drop the link to your book when you come back so that we can go in and, and look at it. 
All right, you guys are rocking and rolling. Have fun in your breakout rooms. Elves, but anyway, nonetheless, um, thank you so much for showing up from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for just filling my Tuesday with your amazing energy. And I want you to know that you are amazing. You are extraordinary and that you are doing beautifully on your business journey. And I hope to see you again on Tuesday when we do Kingdom Business again. You don't have to register again. Just show up, same Zoom channel, same Zoom time, and I will see you then. And as you go about your day, powerhouses, let me gently remind you, never pass up the opportunity to take the mic. Bye-bye, loves. Enjoy your day. Continue to work on your vision plan. Thank you, Queen. Thank you, love. Thank you, everybody. Can you post Queen? Yeah. Can you drop that link? What's his name again? <laughs> you know, he gets me every time, and I don't know why I keep losing it. I know. <laughs>